Hi, welcome to Freedom in Christ Ministries. I'm Matt Massengale. I'm here with Neil Anderson. And we're doing the fourth in a series of the Steps to Freedom. We introduced the steps in video number one, Neil, and step two, we went through a little bit more about the personal application of that. In video three, we actually talked about how to set your marriage free. And in this particular video, we're going to talk about how to do it in a corporate setting in the church. Does this same process work in the church as well as it does a family? You know, my, my co-author, Chuck Mylander, uh, has been such a good friend because he was the denominational leader. So we had some churches we could actually practice on. Oh. It, it uh, was was interesting because after working through the individual steps and then applying the same kind of methodology, including God, is the essence of it. Because um, God wants his marriages to be one in Christ. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, could this apply to corporate conflict resolution? Is there, is there such a thing as corporate repentance? You realize, I said, we as evangelicals stress a personal relationship with God. The emphasis there is that it's a personal thing, not, you know, an uh, inanimate kind of an object or whatever else. I said, but sometimes we do that at the expense of a corporate relationship. Letters are written to churches. Uh, God responds to countries. He raises up countries, brings down countries, responds to churches and ministries as, as corporate entities. And, um, and the basis for this and our thinking really was the seven churches in Revelation. He's writing to seven churches, not to people, churches. And, um, and through those seven letters, we, we have as an exercise in the process, as in preparation for that, go through those two chapters and count how many times the word I occurs. And it's about like 50 times that I is Christ. And, um, but... Every once, you know, it says, I have this for you, I have this against you. And, uh, and every one ends with a statement, let him who has an ear hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches, not just individuals, to churches. So it's not a question of, is God here? Is he present? Does he care about us as a church? Whatever else. The question is, really, are we listening? And, um, and so we laid out a, a, an issue that we hope can help bring conflict resolution to actual churches. Uh, as a denominational leader, Chuck said, I would see churches have this problem and they have a problem pastor, a problem board member, and the pastor would leave. And it seemed like they would just repeat the same error again and again and again. And, and why is that? If you go back and look at the history of this, for instance, when Israel and Judah divided, Israel never had one godly king. Not one. And instead of everyone, don't believe me, go back in your scripture and read it. Everyone said when a new king came on, and he reigned for so many years, and he continued in the sins of Jeroboam. They could, everyone, everyone continued wow. in the sins of Jeroboam. Uh, it, it's, uh, now I'm convinced, see, that every generation that comes along could have said to Jeroboam, you know, this is wrong. We're going to go back to Jerusalem and worship with God created. None of them did. And eventually God raised up Assyria and, and Israel was no more. And Judah had seven godly kings, four in a row, by the way, after Jezebel and Ahab, <laughs> his whole family were totally taken, I mean, literally 72 heads were stacked in a heap someplace. And the priest rolls up and, and, and uh, just countered that. I think this is such a dynamic testimony of what could happen. That, but hear this and then we'll try to explain how that could happen. I purchased a set of Neil's tapes, Resolving Personal and Spiritual Conflicts. After listening to the tapes, I began applying the principles to my problems. I realized that some of my problems could be spiritual attacks. And I learned how to take a stand and won victories over some of my problems in my life. That was only the tip of the iceberg. I'm a deacon and preacher in a Baptist church, and my pastor was suffering from depression and other problems that I was not aware of. And he committed suicide. Wow. This literally brought our church to its knees. I knew of some of the problems of the previous pastors and felt it was spiritual, but I didn't know how to relay it to the people since the devil or a demon cannot affect a Christian, right? <laughs> the church elected me as their interim pastor. While in a local bookstore, I saw a copy of your book called Setting Your Church Free. I purchased it, read it. I felt with all the spiritual suppression in our church that this was the answer. There was only one problem. How to get the other people to believe it. After a few weeks of preaching on spiritual issues, I knew we had to do what you instructed in your book. The previous pastor who had killed himself would not believe your material. 
He would not even read it or listen to your message. Slowly, very slowly, the people accepted the message and I was able to contact one of your staff. He flew to Houston and led the leaders of our church through the steps to setting your church free. The leaders loved it. I felt step one was passed. Next, I wanted to take all the people through the steps to freedom. Six weeks later, I was able to do so. I really don't understand it, but we were set free from the spiritual bondage of multiple problems. I can't put it all in a letter or I would write a book. During all of this time, one of my middle-aged members, an evangelist, was set free. He learned who he was in Christ and is back in ministry. I saw the daughters of the deceased pastor set free and able to forgive their father, and they were able to go on with their lives. And at one point, one of the girls was contemplating suicide. This is a new church. God is free to work here. In September, we founded our pulpit committee. Our church voted 100% for our new pastor. That has never happened in our church before. And this was an independent fundamental Baptist church. Well, when you do things God's way, you get God's results. I also work one night a week in our county jail, which is the second largest in the country. I work with homosexual men, and I have seen many set free. This is a comprehensive message, isn't it, Matt? I yes. mean, we're, we're not just dealing with one or two individual problems. I mean, it is so comprehensive. When you bring God into the process, God always takes into account all reality, the natural world, the spiritual world, all that he created. And, uh, and all of this is really a result of truly applying the gospel, the whole gospel. Mm -hmm. That he didn't come just to forgive us. He came to give us life. He didn't come even just to do that. He came to undo the works of Satan. And we got churches that are just really under siege. And, and, and most of them don't even know it. And, and they, they just repeat this pathology. We've talked to a number of church consultants who go out and analyze churches, whatever else. And we heard kind of a consistent thing after a while. I mean, they hadn't thought it through that well, but th but as we did, we kind of helped them realize it themselves. I said, unless this church comes to terms with this past, it has no future. Uh, I believe that every present-day leadership right now has a responsibility to resolve these issues, to present the church, pure, spotless, and non-defiled, to get this church right with God. And actually, if you don't, you participate in the sin. You're as guilty as the ones who created it. And it will continue to perpetuate until eventually the church kind of slows up and dies and, and, and on you go. And I said, so there is a way. And in the same kind of a concept, God is here. It's his church. You know, we're just the bride of Christ. You know, he's the groom. Does God care about his church? Well, he loves his church. He died for the church. I mean, that's his body. Yes. It's, the church is the body of Christ. And uh, so... Expect God to be involved in the process of helping us work through. And so in the, in the testimony you just read, he said the elders loved it, the deacons, whatever they were. We found that to be true. They would drag their feet coming in, but not going out. This is not a finger-pointing exercise. We're not trying to cast blame on somebody. We're actually trying to resolve the conflict. That can only be resolved on a corporate level. There are certain things within marriage that got to be married as, as a couple because... They're one in Christ. Are and the churches aware of the conflict? I mean, they know something's there, but are they aware of really what it is? Well, I'll be honest with you. I've gone into some churches, you can cut the air with, with a knife. It is so thick. One stands out to me. I, I, I preached Sunday morning before I started the conference, the regular conference, and I asked the pastor in the middle, I said, you want to talk about what's going on here? He said, what? I said, oh, come on. The air is so thick in here, my Bible fell off the pulp in the first service and it hasn't hit the ground yet. You can cut the air with a knife. I mean, my wife and our colleague's friend were up in the Bellevue praying. I mean, it was just so obvious. And it turned out there was two staff, bitterly hated, really, the other two staff. And I said, you'll never, that church has no future until that those kind of issues are resolved. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are other churches that are healthy. I said, who does this? You know, when I first wrote the book, I said, oh my gosh, some layman's going to read this thing. Here, Pastor, we need this in our church. And the pastor's going to read the book. <laughs> and he won't do it. And why won't he do it? I said, you know, since the present edition is the second edition and it's totally rewritten because we learned some stuff, but it's more than that. What, I, what we found out over the years was that what kind of churches want to do this? Good churches that want to get better. Well, it's the bad churches that need it. Why won't the bad churches do it? Why are the bad churches bad? 
It's really because of the leadership, and the leadership reads this and realizes this could expose them, and so they're not going to do it. <laughs> Isn't that a tragic thing to say? But unfortunately, it's, it is true. It's true. It's true. And it's usually somebody covering up sins. It's like somebody's covering up something, and uh, they don't want to get exposed. And so we're, we're, it's not our, in our business to expose it. I remember uh, one of the first experiences our national director had at that time. He said, well, I'm really concerned that we could split a church with this. I said, why? What's the issue? Well, you know, I went to this church. I went through the process. It really was successful, I guess, I said. But what happened was, was the, uh, uh, as we presented it to him, the pastor really wanted to, wanted to do this. But two deacons were against it. I had three of them were. And as soon as they committed to do it, two left the church. Folks, mm. they're running. They know that this is going to expose them, so they took off. The third one came and just sat in the back with his arms folded, and then he left the church. And, uh, and I said, well, how do you think that split the church? What, what was the result of that? Well, the result actually was the church rose up and gave the, cha- the pastor a pastor's appreciation day. In other words, essentially they say, we won. <laughs> we finally got rid of those turkeys. Now, that's not in our heart. We want them to repent. We, we're not trying to get rid of anybody. But if, if, they, if they won't repent, if they've got the, these kind of problems, good, they left. I mean, you know, repent or get out of here. I mean, church discipline should have gotten rid of Main House a long time ago. This is a, a tool here. It's just a tool. This doesn't set your church free. What, your, what sets them free is the elders and the, or the board coming together with key staff. I've done this not with just churches. We've done this with the largest mission group in the world, uh, which was incredible. I mean, and, and I've done it with the largest denomination. And in every case, it, it was impacting. And, uh, but it's just them getting right with God. It's just them being honest with God. They've got to individually find their freedom first, or, or this isn't going to work. And so you, you've got to help them say, now how do we resolve this conflict? And you say, what are the conflicts? Well, what we do is we start out, first of all, by them praying and asking God to reveal to their minds, what are we doing right? That, that's, uh, that, that's a very important step, one you could easily bypass. But in the seven letters to the churches in Revelation, he said, he, he points that out. That's how we started. You're doing this, you're doing this. You know, Some of me had nothing good to say about it, by the way. But, mm-hmm. but I said, if you're, under, you're, you're going to expose a lot of weaknesses, which is our second step. So you want to put it in perspective. Every church is doing a few things well. Uh, you know, Any church that would invite us to do that, that's where we start from. Ask God, to show, what are we doing well? Put it, put it in perspective. Was that easy for them to identify? Well, you, and we want some agreement on that thing. We want them to, to come to a kind of conclusion. Here's five or six, seven things that we're really doing well. Because what we do is we have paper all on the wall. And, and what will happen is, is that it, it's, you will start to see a pattern emerge after a while. But keep that in perspective. Just set it aside for right now. Then the second step is, pray God, what are our weaknesses? Hmm. And every church is going to say, how can we got... We identify seven strengths, we identify 32 weaknesses. <laughs> As every church does that, so don't let it bother you. But we don't try to find out the critical ones. We just leave it right there. And, um, and then we, we look at painful memories. Uh, problems that our churches have had in the past that are, that are painful. And they are painful, folks. I mean, it's, it's really interesting. What we're looking at is corporate forgiveness. That was... That was new to me at the time, and we, we thought it through. But let me give you an illustration. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, where they had to confront somebody and basically kind of kick him out of the church because he was doing horrible sins. And then the text says, Now we urge you to forgive. You is plural there. He's not talking about individually. You, you to forgive, for we're not ignorant of Satan's schemes. Jeez. Actually, the same word as thoughts. Or mine, and uh, so Satan is going to take advantage of that. I got a quote in here from Francis of Assisi. Read that. That is so revealing. If you've got unforgiveness like that in your churches, how does that leave you vulnerable? Listen to this. One day, while at prayer alone in his cell, Saint Francis saw a vision of a whole home, house surrounded and besieged by devils. They were like a great army surrounding the place, but none of them could gain entrance to the house. 
The brothers were so disciplined and devoted in their lives of sanctity that the devils were frustrated without a host upon whom they might find a way in. It happened in the days soon after Francis' vision that one of the brothers became offended by another. Hmm. And he began to think in his heart of ways to revenge the slight. While the scheming brother was devising vengeful plans, entertaining wicked thoughts, the devil, finding an open door, entered the community upon his back. Boy. Francis, the watchful shepherd of the flock, saw that the wolf had entered, intending to devour his little sheep. And at once, Francis called the brother to him and asked him to disclose the hatred that had caused this disturbance in the house. The brother, frightened that Francis knew the content of his heart, disclosed to him all of the venom and malice that consumed him, acknowledging his fault and begging humbly for forgiveness. Loving his sheep as does the father, the shepherd soon absolved the brother, and immediately at that moment, before his very face, Francis saw the devil flee from his presence. The brother returned <clears throat> to the flock, and the wolf was gone from the house. Now think about that for a moment. That's a true story. And uh, take it for, as a fact. When I've asked congregations that have gone through our personal sessions on, on forgiveness to make a commitment to stand, there's one or more people you need to forgive. 95% of the people will stand every time. They found a host to come into this church. And, and, and I asked 600 pastors one time. I said, how many of you give a message in the morning on how to forgive from the heart, and what it means and how to do it. Not one person raised their hand. And, and yet that is the biggest issue we deal with, individually, as marriages, as well as, as, as churches. This is a fascinating process, because hopefully every man or woman or elder, whatever your leadership is, has gone through this individually, first of all. They've forgiven people. There's another layer above that. It, it's corporate forgiveness. It's in mass to forgive people. And every church has had people who've done damage to the church and at least painful memories. And uh, as they go through the process, it almost always ends up that it's late in the morning and we break for lunch. And it's a good thing because almost every time I've done this thing, they're in the dry eye in there. Mm. And there there's, there's people who are carrying a lot of pain in, in churches along this line. And if you forgive another person as Christ has forgiven you, it's the most Christ-like thing you'll ever do. And so... It's true. In the in the Second Corinthians illustration, it was discipline. They should have carried it out, and in this one case, they had to let him go. You know, but the pain is still there. Mm -hmm. The the people, some people knew him. Some people are mad at him. Some people are, you know, and uh, and you think, well, he's gone now, so the problem's over with. No, it isn't. The the pain is still in the church, mm -hmm. and um, so processing that has been. <laughs> I had a guy in England one time, we were talking to him, and he, he, all of a sudden he said, wait a minute, have you read the book on setting your marriage free? Or setting your church free? I said, well, yeah, how'd you know? Well, some church in Australia asked me to do this. I didn't even know, so I quickly read the book, and I just, you know, did what you said. I just took that chapter and just led him through that process. And he said, all these stoic men were all in tears by noon, he said. <laughs> it was really kind of fascinating. So, you think the problem's done. You know, we got rid of the bum, and so the problem's solved. I said, no, it's, it's still there. It's still there. And, uh, and then we looked at ways that churches are under attack. Not because you're doing something wrong, because you're doing something right. Mm -hmm. We don't often think that way. But as you read through the letters, it's amazing. This is where Satan had his throne. This is where Satan... And, and, and read those, those seven letters and think if you're not involved in a spiritual problem or not. And, and realize how many times, you know, John at that time, the author, points out the fact this is a synagogue of Satan. And, um, well, think about the one pastor that committed suicide. Yeah, yeah. That was deeply affected hundreds of people or oh, thousands. Of absolutely. People. And disillusioned with leadership and God himself. You yeah. know, yeah. Um, so actually, this is one of the funnest things that I do. I mean, when I've had the privilege to help a church, I've led a big ministry through this process. And uh, we're not there to expose people's lives or sin. Hopefully they've dealt with individual problems. And, and a lot of times, uh, it isn't mega things that we dealt with, uh, but they're all critical. They're all very, very important. And God knows that. He knows everything about it. And when you include God in the process and allow them to assume their responsibility, again, you're just coming in as a facilitator. You're not coming in as some church expert who somehow or another talks to people and give you advice on how to you know, change your, your church structure. You're just allowing these people, in a corporate sense, 
what a born should do to get right with God. I, I can tell you the spiritual health of almost any church on almost one issue. Are the board members coming together to exert their opinion and their influence, or are they coming together collectively to discern God's will for their life? I said, uh, that alone will tell you the spiritual climate of your church. Um, the man who endorsed my uh, book and wrote the foreword for it, Dean Johnson, I did a conference at church years ago. One of my students went to his church and he found out I was coming to the area. He said, would you do a conference? And Dean said, well, what's it about? Well, it's kind of on spiritual warfare. He said, absolutely not. And he was just totally against it. And, uh, and my former student said, well, it's not really on that. It's, it's really on just repentance and, you know, belief in God and whatever else. And so he called me. He said, well, that sounds totally different. He apparently he involved in some power encounters and that really upset him and would have nothing to do with it anymore. But once Dean got hold of this, uh, oh man, it had a personal effect on his own life, but he act, ended up becoming the district superintendent and um, in the uh, north central part of the United States for the Evangelical Free Church. And uh, I did a conference at Crystal Evangelical Free Church, and he coordinated it with his district meeting. And he, and he had all this passion and courage him to stay. Oh, was that an incredible hmm. weekend. We had 1,500 people for a week for that conference then. And uh, we sold $60,000 worth of material. I, I'm not in this for the money, folks, but I mean, to just show you how they grabbed up that material. Well, Dean himself had led about 25 churches through this process and speaks about that in the introduction. And he said, in five, it didn't have much of an impact. I said, write that. Be honest about it. Why didn't it? He said, they weren't taking it seriously. They were just going through the motions because they asked him to do it. But the others had a profound change. He said, one was so profound, after the event, I spoke Sunday morning, and between the two services, two people had no knowledge that we had done this as, a, as the board and staff, came up and said, Dean, something has changed in this church. The spiritual climate had changed so much yeah. that two lay people commented on it. It just feels different here. Yeah. The oppression was gone. Uh, well, thanks for listening, folks. We just want you to be aware of this. We should probably come back and talk about the leadership aspects that are involved in this. Uh, because you can resolve the conflict, but if you go back to your same management style and same leadership style, you probably it's like you got a shot across the bow, but you didn't turn the ship. And so what we're interested in is, is helping you turn the ship in the direction God wants you to do. God wants you free. God wants your marriage free. God wants your church free. It's for freedom that Christ set us free. Thanks for listening.